metta. Yeah. So he said that these three are like a trilogy. All right? So normally we would start with the Ratana Sutta because that will allow you to develop faith, confidence in the teachings of the Buddha. All right? So you, as today we look through in the Ratana Sutta about the Buddha, about his teachings, about the enlightened the disciples. So you develop faith. All right? Having de developed faith, then you're able to live your, your life in accordance with what the Buddha has taught. So that's where the Mangala Sutta is. So if you follow the Mangala Sutta, all right, in its essence, then you get what is called blessings, isn't it? That's what the Mangala Sutta is all about. And uh, for those of you who were here the last time, we, we said that there are 38 different types of blessings if you follow the Mangala Sutta. All right? Now, having put into practice the Mangala Sutta in your everyday life, all right, then what kind of attitude do we do we take towards life? What kind of attitude? So it's an attitude of loving kindness, an attitude of compassion. So then the Metta Sutta comes in. You see? So it is said that this tree kind of represents the entire fabric of Buddhist teachings. Right? So Metta Sutta is also a meditation, develop your mind, you know, cultivate compassion and kindness and so on. So the Ratana Sutta you start with to develop faith, confidence, Satta, as they say. Then you put into practice all right, what the Buddha taught, which is enumerated in the Mangala Sutta. They call it uh, blessings. And finally, you, you, you turn your, your, your mind towards ones which is based on compassion and loving kindness. All right? So that tree sums up. And what is interesting is, all three suttas actually come from the same, same part of the Buddhist canon. Okay? So I thought before I go to the Ratana Sutta itself, there are 17 verses, right? 17 verses. So we're trying to cover 17 verses in one hour. So we're not doing due justice. Huh? But then, you know, this is, a, this is just an appetizer or a, de or a dessert, right? So not a main course. Right? So you're on the main course, then you either read the Sutta itself or attend Achan Brahmali's <laughs> course, all right? Now the okay, so I, I think it's important for for you to know two other things before I go into the discourse. One is uh, Ratana Sutta, Mangala Sutta, or even Metta Sutta, Karaniya Metta Sutta. They are what is generally called paritas. You, you, have you heard of the word paritas? Yeah, I think if you have been to if you have a frequent visitor to Brickfields Temple, the, the Singhalese call it pirit, pirit, yeah? maha. Right? But in Pali, it's uh, parita. Okay, so what is paritas? So paritas are actually uh, protective verses. Protective verses. Yeah? Where conveys, uh, it, it confers blessings on the uh, audience, whoever recites it. Okay? Or the monks may recite it. Then that is why uh, paritas are recited during auspicious occasions. Like, for example, during housewarming, all right, birth of uh, you know, babies are born, or getting a new job, you know, <laughs> you know, or even someone even have paritas recited when they bought a new car. <laughs> you know, all right? Huh? Water, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sprinkle, sprinkle water on the, on, on the car. So all, all those uh, external you know, manifestations of what we consider as blessings. And likewise, please, <laughs> likewise, uh, I've just started, so it's okay. Uh, li li likewise, when people say, oh, the house is haunted, so they also invite monks to chant some paritas. All right? uh, then they say, ask the monks to come and exorcise the spirits. Well, actually, that's not true, isn't it? So if you, are, if you think in terms of like the, if you watch movies, like you know, the, the exorcist, that the, Priest suddenly come, he exercise, he fight with the spirits. But actually, it, that's not the, the, the way in when, when Buddhists chant paritas. In fact, during, during parita chanting, they actually welcome the spirits. <laughs> Say, may you be well and happy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you see? So it's just the reverse. All right? And of course, Buddhists believe that when paritas are recited, 
the bad spirits who are there, they try to catch out you, but at the same time, the good spirits come down. Right? The good spirits, they also come. And um, so when all the good spirits are there, so all the, the evil spirits, they, they also go away. Like, like someone give the analogy, you know, when, uh, when you have a grand occasion, if, if the king is there or the prime minister is there, all the, 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 the police but personnel is there, then all the thieves and the, they, they won't be around, right? They won't be around. So in the same manner, when you recite all those uh, Buddha's words, the paritas, so Buddhists believe that the, the good spirits, the, the devas and so on, they, they come down and then the evil spirits will just move away. Of course, I, say, I use the word believe, right? Because <laughs> I don't expect you to, 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 to believe it, but you want to believe it's fine. But that's not the crux of today's talk. So this brings another point. This sutta itself, there's a lot of reference to spirits, devas. Yeah, devas. The word we use is devas. D-E-V-A. Deva. Deva is a Pali word or Sanskrit word. When you translate the word deva, it actually means, you know what it means? Shining beans or radiant bean. Right? And interestingly enough, that word deva is very close to the Greek word deus. Uh, D-E-U-S Deus You know the word Deus? Right? If you check your dictionary Deus is a, is, a, is a term that the Europeans use to refer to their gods If you watch uh, you watch Hercules m m movies Clash of the Titans you know uh, those kind of movies you find the gods are always fighting right? Uh, so the gods so the concept of Deus So from Deus then the Romans uh, change it to Jupiter You know the god Jupiter Right? So, so you, you can see similarities, deus, devas, right? Why? Because Sanskrit, or, or Pali is Sanskrit, actually comes from one common source. It's called the indu gangetic languages. Right? indu gangetic lang lang languages. So s certain words are, sit, are quite similar. Right? The German word for father and the, and the Pali word for father, or, or Sanskrit word. They have some similarities. Okay? So the devas. Now, Today's talk, I'm not going to talk about devas, but I just want to, <laughs> to, 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 to mention that the, the devas, we translate as gods in English, right? Gods, small g, but with an S at the back, plural. So, many. Okay? So, in Buddhist cosmology, Buddhist cosmo you know cosmology? That means uh, the, the world of the, the universe and so on. So, Buddhist cosmology, uh, in the Theravada tr tradition, they talk about 31 planes of existence. 31 planes. Yeah? Uh, this is compressed in the Chinese or in the Tibetan tradition into six, six worlds. Okay? So let's understand six worlds rather than 31. Okay? So the six world, one of those six worlds is the, the God world, the Deva realm. The, the Deva realm. Okay? So in the Deva realm it itself, in, in, in Buddhist cosmology, you not you don't really have uh, one deva realm, right? You have got six deva realms, right? Six. So there are six levels of devas. From what is called the earth, uh, those devas that have got close proximity with human beings have more contact with human beings, right up to the highest of the six heaven. So to so in the Ratana Sutta, you find a phrase where the where the Buddha calls upon the devas and non-human beings. So devas in Pali, of course, is devas. Then the other word in your, you have the Pali translation, it's called buta. B-H-U-T-A, buta. So buta will be non-human beings. So, so in Buddhist cosmology, so they also exist, this category of non-human beings, not seen by the ordinary human eye. Okay? So as I mentioned, six categories of deva, but we will not go into that, yeah? The, the most common one is the lowest of the six, the, the six, which is called the four heavenly gods. Not, not the Hong Kong movie, not that one. These are the four, four, four the Chatu, Maharaja, Jika, Devas. Chatu means four, Raja, Maharaja, Jika, Devas. So four. So they are called four because they guard the four directions, north, south, east, west. If you are from Penang, as some of you are, you go to Kekloksi, or in fact, I think any Chinese Buddhist temple, the entrance, you find they, they got this uh, four fierce looking right, uh, generals, right? 
stars. They are actually su supposed to represent the four heavenly gods, Chatu, Maharaja, Jika. All right? And uh, if you read one of the paritas called the Atanyata Parita, which is found in the Dika Nikaya, each of these four guardian uh, deities have got have got the <laughs> uh, they got gang, they, they got supporters. Uh, they got supporters, they, they got like like uh, ish oh, what what is the word that they use? They they, they have like fo fo followers, uh, you know, troops, they have troops, yeah, they have troops, you know. So like for example in, in, in the north, so the, the deva that guards through the north. So the one uh, Visavana, uh, you, you know. So the one who supports him are a group of beings, Buddhas you can call them, called the Yakas. Uh, so the Yakas are from they got the they are like the followers of the the, the north, the northern general, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, yakas. Yakas is Pali. Sanskrit is Yaksha. Chinese chronicle Yao Kuai. Yao Kuai. So you got Yakas. So they are at the at, at the north. Then because there are four directions, right? So the the, 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 the Deva that guards the south, then they also have, have got another group of Bhutas or, or beans, right? Uh, so you know what are they called? No. The, the musician is Gandabas. So they are called Kumbandas. Kumbandas. So they are in the south. Right? Kumbandas. Right. Different, different. Kumbanda. Well, <laughs> don't don't worry, I, I I'm just this is just just some some advertisement and it's not the, the real thing. So they are called kum Kumbandas, right? And then <laughs> of course you got on the west and then you got on the east. Uh, then on the west will be the Nagas. The Nagas. And in the stories, the Nagas, they're always fighting with the Garudas. <laughs> you know, Garudas, the bird, the bird like the national emblem of, of, in, of Indonesia, Garuda Indonesia. So you've got Garudas and Nagas, they're always fighting. Then on the right, uh, on the east, you have the, the Gandabas. The Gandabas are the celestial musicians. When did we first hear about the Gandabas? When Prince Siddhartha was, is, was uh, in his search for enlightenment. You remember, towards, towards just before he became enlightened, he was practicing austerity. He was so thin that uh, the, the, the picture of, of him in, in, in the British Museum <laughs> shows that you know, he was, the, you know he was so thin that you could actually put your hand and then you can even touch it. You know, he was so, so thin. Why? Because he has, he has been eating one grain of rice. One grain of rice. Because at that time, the thinking was self mortification. Or you torture yourself until you, know, you torture yourself to the extreme, then finally you attain nirvana, attain enlightenment. So he tried that. He tried that. But it was, it was leading him nowhere. Leading him nowhere. Right? Then it is said <laughs> in the evening, he was trying to, you know, in his, again in his meditating, then he heard. In the forest, right? He heard some sound. Some sound, right? First time when he heard the sound, the sound was, 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 was terrible. <laughs> it was very gross, right? Then when he when he inquired further, he found that actually it was a celestial musician. It was playing the, the, the what, what is that? The, the, the Indian? No, 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 no. The, 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 the lute, the lute. The, the, the lute and uh, it seemed that the, the, the strings uh, in the lute was too loose was too loose so the sound wasn't nice to hear then of course the second time when he when he was back in meditation he heard again the sound but this time the sound was like very uh, screechy and when he found out it was too tight right? so I'm sure you know the conclusion right <laughs> then, then the third time when he hear the sound again this time it was just nice Melodious, right? And when he inquired further, the strings were not too tight; they were not too loose. Then he said, "Ah, uh, like Archimedes said, Eureka, <laughs> you know." So he, so he said, "That's the way." Mm, middle path. Right? Then he sat and meditated, and, and of course, after that, he became the Buddha, right? So, so that's the Gandabas. 
So they are very famous as musicians. Now they are called, uh, they are not really devas in that sense because they are the, the devas retinue. You have the devas retinue. Okay? So you, you, you will, you will, if you come, you come across those names, so I thought I'd just, just man, man mention to you. Now in the deva, just now I mentioned about six worlds, right? You got a human world, uh, you got human world, you got the deva world, you got the hell beings, and then you got the hungry ghosts, animal realm, and you got one more which, uh, which is called the asuras. Uh, Chinese called asulo. <laughs> uh, you see the word asuras, if you understand simple Pali, the R, the A in, in front is always negative, right? Prefix is ne negative. So sura, what is sura? Asura. Sura is what? Sun. Uh, God. So it's the fallen gods. Fallen angels. <laughs> so it's called the fallen angels. So Asura. Asura. Fallen, fallen. They, they, they fall. Because uh, in Buddhist mythology, the, 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 the gods and the Asuras are always fighting. Always fighting. Just, uh, just now I mentioned to you the, the, the Nagas and the Garudas. Right? Now what does this tell us? Let us not be so fascinated with the fact that they are fighting. Let's understand this concept that they are, they are fighting. Number one, they have power, but they are not enlightened. Right? You don't find Buddhas fighting, you don't find Arahats fighting, right? Uh, Shaolin monks, yes, of course they fight, but, but they fight for self, self for, to, for exercise, self-defense. But you, you don't, but you find the, the unenlightened beings, they always fight, isn't it? So that tell, tells you that in the Buddhist cosmology, one does not aspire to be born as a deva. <laughs> no, that's not our final aspiration. Right? Final aspiration is either be arahants or become Buddhas. You know? So that's the, the aspiration. Okay? That is why if you recite the nine virtues of the Buddha, one of it is what? Sata Deva Manu Sanang. That means he's the master of gods and men. Sata Deva Manu Sanang. Manu Sanang from the word Manusia, isn't it? So you know, so if we we know Bahasa Malaysia, we're very easy to understand Pali, because the the, the, the source is actually the, the same. So Satta means a master, okay, okay. So that's the Pratana Sutta. You find a lot of this reference to Deva. So I thought I just give you some background. Now, where did the Ratana Sutta comes from? It comes from a part of the Buddhist scripture, in the Pali tradition. All right, you know Pali canon. A anyone here who is very new to Buddhism? No, all, okay, doesn't matter. So, uh, the form of Buddhism that, that this sutta comes from is the one that is found in countries like Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka. We call them Southern Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism. Thera, Thera means an elder, right? So, Theravada Buddhism. And the scriptures are written in Pali, P-A-L-I. Pali is an ancient Indian language comparable to Sanskrit. I'm sure you've heard of Sanskrit, right? Now, the Buddha did not speak Pali because Pali is not a language. Pali is like Latin, right? It's in a way, it's like Pali means text, T-E-X-T, okay? What language did the Buddha speak? He spoke the Magadi dialect, Champola. <laughs> he can speak many languages. Once he was asked, can you teach in Sanskrit? He said, of course, but he will not teach in Sanskrit. Why? Because he wants the ordinary person to understand his message. So he teach in the vernacular, as we say. So that's the, that's the reason. So from there, we know the Buddha, if he wants, he could speak in, in Sanskrit. But he chose to speak the common language so that the ordinary man could understand. So that's because of his compassion. Right? Okay. So Ratana Sutta comes from the Pali scriptures. Pali scriptures, as you know, divide into three sections, right? First section is for the monks and nuns. There are rules for monks and nuns. We shall leave, leave that out. The second section comprises his teachings that he has taught for 45 years, which 500 years later, it was put down into writing. When the Buddha was teaching, it was not recorded. There was no tape recorder, there was no iPad. You know, nobody re re recorded his teaching. It was oral. And how did they transmit the teachings? By people who chanted, who chanted them. And these people are called Barnikas. Barnikas. Right? This word, Barnikas. Barnikas are reciters. So they recite. That is why when you read the scriptures, very, how can say, very you know? uh, Repeat again and again and, and again. Three times always, right? So that you don't miss out. 
because it's oral tradition. Oral tra tra tradition, right? So, 500 years later, it was written down. Yeah. Now, today, this, this sutta is found in the second part of the scriptures. The third part is a higher teaching, the Abhidhamma. We leave that out. Yeah. So, in the second part of the Buddhist scriptures, the second part itself is divided into five books, five collections, five collections. Yeah? Again, we don't have time to go through all. So this sutta comes from the last of the five collections. Okay? The first collection is long discourses. Only 34 suttas. Because they are so long. <laughs> 34 suttas. Second group, middle length sayings. Not too long, not too short. So middle length. So uh, 152. 152 suttas. Then the third section is called the Sangyuta. They are connected. The topics are connected. Maybe there's a topic about five cents space. There's another topic about dependent origination. They are all connected. So they are called connected discourses. All right. And there, I don't know, maybe three thousand suttas, <laughs> very short ones. Yeah, very short ones. Yeah. Then you got the fourth, the fourth collection. The the teachings of the Buddha are arranged in or in numbers, in numerical order. So. If the Buddha said, there's one thing I propose, then books into book of one. If the Buddha said, there are two things you must do, then it falls into two books of two. Then the Buddha says, there are three things, like three refuges, book of three. Then Buddha says, the ocean has got eight characteristics, just as my teachings have got eight characteristics. Okay, goes to book of eight. So f until there are 11. So the 11 sections. So that's the fourth one. Okay? So there's the fourth book. But I said there's the fifth one, right? Okay. So before I come to the fifth one, the first four, the first four are found in I told you in the Theravada, in the Pali tradition, right? You'll find similar ones in the Chinese tradition. Right? It's called Agamas. Agamas. Okay? But in Sanskrit, not in Pali. In Sanskrit. Okay, so now come to the fifth one. The fifth one, after the the, the, the monks, you know, they were, they were trying to put the suttas, okay, some, this one go to the long one, this one go middle length, this one go connected. Then they scratch hey, hey, some of these suttas, don't know where to, 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 to put them. Uh. They said, maybe not so many. So we call them the minor collection. Minor collection. But, after a period of time, they keep on adding, adding, adding. And I think today, you, the, uh, the Thai version has got 15 books. The Burmese has got 18 books into the fifth one. All right? And what are some of these books? You Actually, you know them. They are like the Dhammapada. You've heard of Dhammapada, right? So they're found in the fifth one. And then you've got the Udana. You know, the Ions, the Pions of Joy. You remember the story about the blind man, he was touching the different parts of the elephant? Yeah? So where does that story come from? That story comes from the, U the Udana. Not Ashok's fables. You know. <laughs> it comes from the Udana. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Right, so that then you got the Teri Gata, Tera Gata, when the monks become en enlightened, they are so joyful. So they, they utter their you know the utterances, peons of joy. Likewise, the nuns when they became en enlightened, so it all collected into that. And one of it is called Sutta Nipata. So you got the S N. You see the word S N. So the small N, Sutta Nipata. If I put the big N, it becomes Sangyuta Nikaya. <laughs> So it's like different. Don't get confused. Huh? So it's not a typo error. It's not that I, I, I forgot upper key, then I type lo lower key. <laughs> Small f means Sutta Nipata. Now what is Sutta Nipata? Sutta Nipata is one of those books in the fifth collection. And in the Sutta Nipata, you have your famous um, Metta Sutta in Sutta Nipata. You see, this is 2.1, right? Why 2.1? <laughs> Because in Sutta Nipata itself, there are five volumes. So the Metta, the Metta Sutta would be one point, I think 1.6, I think. Sutta, <laughs> the first book. So this is Ratana Sutta. This is the, f the, the first Sutta in this second section. All right? The first section is called uh, Uragavana, which is the snake. Yeah? Then you got Chulavaga, all right? the smallest, and then Mahavaga. Then, then the and the tomb, I can't remember the, 
yeah, the, the, two, the, the two names. Yeah? So you got five. So the, the, the Ratana Sutta comes from here. So you know the, the context where, where it comes. I think it's important if you want to study the, 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 the suttas to know where it comes from. Okay? So that's authenticity. Now, then the important thing is for, for us, because we, we read in English, right? So who are the, the translators of this text are very Im important. Okay? So to today, the latest book, Sutta Nipata, the SN, the Sutta Nipata, Bhikkhu Bodhi has just come up with a text. I'm not sure whether BGF has got a copy. You have a copy, right? So maybe those of you who are keen, you should get a copy. That's one of the best, uh, best tr translations you can have. So there are two, two, two Western monks who, who does all the translations now, Bhikkhu Bodhi and Achan Thani Saro. Uh, but this translation that I'm going to give you a short while is by Venerable Pia Dasi. Pia Dasi, yeah? Who is Venerable Pia da Dasi? Pia Dasi is a spouse away. He's one of those Sri Lankan monks who are in the caliber of our late Chief Reverend. Gone on those days. Huh? No. <laughs> you, 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 the, the days of the Pia Dasi, the Narada, the Damananda, the Sadaloka, they are, they are, they are, they are all gone. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's, that's the background. Oop. Okay. I'm just going to give you the... Bobby told me there will be 35 who sign up, but I told him you, I'll be happy if 30 would turn up. So I, so I only make 35 copies. So I don't know if there are 35 people here or... 37. Oh. So, so, okay, doesn't matter. I have an Indian actuary who used to say it's better to have the problem of growth than problem of no growth. So, so this is a problem of growth, so, it, so we, are, we are fine. Okay. Now, how I'm going to structure today is, uh, I've taken half an hour, as I, as I promised you, so that, that's the in introduction. So the next uh, one hour, uh, yeah, from, from now is two, right? Okay, so from two to about three o'clock, I'm going to go through that, that, su that sutta with you. There are 17 uh, uh, verses there. And then after that, we can have 30 minutes of Q&A. Then 3.30, we have a short break, all right? Okay, so one, two, so short break, because by then we have law of diminishing returns ready, right? So we should, we should stop. <laughs> then after that, we come back, then you talk. I finish talking. Then you have workshop discussion. I've got some topics for, for you, then we, we discuss. And, and then, you know, we'll, we'll hear from, from you, and then I'll just say a few words, and then I'm done. <laughs> okay. Right. So let's look at this. Uh, everybody managed to get a copy? You don't have? Could you share? Oh, oh. Could we share some? Can? Yeah. Okay. But I, I've got slides too. I've got slides too. So it should be okay. So the structure of the Ratana Sutta, okay, Ratana su Sutta. Ah, by the way, just now I mentioned about Paritas, right? So those of you are really, in, you want to know more about Paritas, the author here, Venerable Pia Dasi, he wrote a book called The Book of Protection. Yeah? So in that book, you can read about different types of Paritas, right? Okay, so you can read it. Now, the structure, right? Address to Devas, so verse 1 and 2. Is addressed to devas. Okay? Then verses 3 to 14, attributes of three jewels. What are the three jewels? The Buddha, the Dhamma. The Dhamma here refers to his teachings. But of course, as we later look at it, Dhamma not necessarily refers to, it refers to Nibbana. Okay? And finally, the Sankha. Okay? So you got three. So that's the attributes of three jewels. And finally, verse 15 to 17, adoration of three jewels by Saka. Who is Saka? You know Saka? Hmm? Heard before? Huh? Tawatimsa. Uh. <laughs> Chief, is it? No. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he, has he has many names. In Pali, is Saka. In, uh, in Sanskrit, is Sakra. 
Then in uh, I think in the Indian mythology he is Indra, right? And then sometimes you know like Ishvara. You know your proton Ish Ishvara, is actually named after him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but but they didn't know. <laughs> if they knew, how best? Yeah, no, they, 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 they didn't. Yeah, Ish Ishvara means the the god, the belief in the god god, right? the the Indian god. So there's a word called Ishvara Diti. Ishvara Diti. So just now, those of you who were in the, the morning class, I mentioned that the first discourse of the long discourses, the 34 sutta, is called Brahma Jala Sutta, right? So one of the 62 wrong views in the Brahma Jala Sutta is about this belief in the Creator God, which is called Ishvara Diti. Huh? Ishvara Diti. So even during the Buddha's time, the Buddha have already laid bare all these arguments about is there a God? Is there a creator God? Is there no creator God? It's all mentioned, in fact, during the Buddha's time. Right? So it is there. So it's not only the Western philosophers, you know. Maybe I, I, I told some of you when I was doing, doing, when I was doing philosophy in my third year, <laughs> my Dutch professor, when he came in, he was teaching philosophy or religion, he said, today class, I'm going to teach you seven proofs that God exists. So he gave us a proof, why God, God exists? Okay, class, when I see you in a week's time, I shall talk to you about seven proofs God don't exist. <laughs> Alright. Serious? Yeah. Okay, so address to Devas. Now, be before that, the background. How did this story of the Ratana Sutta came about? I think it's not there. Right? The background is not there. The background is that uh, the town of Vesali, right, uh, was, was stricken by three misfortunes. This is just a summarized, huh? What is the three misfortunes? First, they had famine. Probably there'd been a drought, you know, too, too long, there's, there's no rain. So there was crops, crops die. When crops die, people don't have enough food to eat. People also die. <laughs> in, in, this is in India, think of it 2,600 years ago. So when there was famine, people die. In, in fact, today, people still die from famine, right? Look at Africa, right? People still die. So what more in India 2,600 years ago? So when, 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 so the story goes that when people start dying, all right, maybe due to poor sanitation, you know, the, the corpse start rotting, and then the evil spirits, the Buddha, the evil spirits came down and start feasting on the, on the, on the, on the corpse, on the carcass, right? Dead animals, dead human beings, they were lying all over the, all over the, the, the place. So people got very frightened, you know, oh, they, they open the, they open the window, they, they, they see one of those evil spirits. Those days, there were no ghostbusters. So, so you, you can't call the Ghostbusters, you know, those days, probably. Right? Or they were thinking, where to find the Ghostbusters? Right? Then, at the same time, there was plague. You know plague? P-L-A-G-U-E, plague. So there was disease. So as a more people die. Right? Uh, then, people were saying, what to do? <laughs> then someone said, oh, you know, we heard that the, the Buddha is staying somewhere nearby. He's supposed to be the enlightened one, you know. He may be able to do something about that, all right? So there was this, I'm not going through the details, there was this group, the, the, the Lichavis and the, and the Vesalis, the different tribes of people at that time. So they decide to invite the Buddha to, to come. I think that time the king was King Pasinadi. Is it mentioned there? King Bimbisara? Oh, okay, so one, one of the kings. And uh, so the, the, the Buddha came and he said that King Bimbisara, King Bimbisara right? so he, he let, you know, clear the, the path for the Buddha and his, and his monks. They always say 500 monks, uh, but you know, no, nobody really counted, so we, we don't know. <laughs> All right, you always hear that 500 monks came, you know. But what it means is many monks, uh, many monks. Uh, you know, Indians are very imaginative, right? 500 monks. <laughs> They're also very good in mathematics, right? Yeah. 500, they can count. So th anyway, the, the, the monks came. Then, the, then before they reached the, the city gates, the Buddha told Ananda. Ananda is one of his disciples. Yeah, his people said, people use this word. Who is Ananda? Ananda is his favorite disciple. Oh, you should not use that word. Buddha has no favoritism. Huh? Isn't it? Uh, Buddha is not, not M, M, M O one. No, 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 no favorite attendance. Huh? So he has no favoritism, right? The uh, Ananda was his. His close attendant. And interestingly enough, do you know Ananda only became his so called personal attendant when? Uh, when the Buddha was 55 years old. 
maybe that's why our early retirement age was 55. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the Indian civil service, their retirement age was 55 until recently. So the Buddha was 55 years old. He felt that, you know, he, then Ananda became his, uh, his kind of his personal attendant. Not his favorite attendant. Huh? Sometimes I, I read texts, oh, the Buddha asked Ananda, his favorite attendant, you know, give the impression he got favoritism. Huh? So the, 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 Okay, so then told Ananda to, to, to recite. To recite certain verses and then sprinkle some holy water. So sprinkle some water. Now, what is the significance of that sprinkle <laughs> holy water? It could mean, it could be a figurative or metaphor, you know, that, that means you clean up the place. Right? But of, of course, uh, folk legends and mythology have interpreted as to, to mean that blessing. You know? So today we have this tradition where monks you know, sprinkle holy water. So, but if you don't have water, so how? How, how to sprinkle? So you can also do recitations, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Recite. Okay. So the whole, I, the whole idea is uh, to radiate loving kindness, blessings, and so as later we, we will see. Right? Okay. So, so that's that's the, the background. So the, because of these three, three calamities. Right. First, you've got famine, people die. Then you've got evil spirits that came, and then thirdly, you've got a plague. Plague. So there was illness and disease. Pe more people died. All right. Okay. Any any questions on that? All right. Okay. Let's 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 look, look at it now. Okay. So the first I told you that seventeen, right? So addressed to devas. Okay. Those of you who don't have the text. Ah, okay. Maybe maybe let let me just show you what our late chief says about about this. He says when we read or know these excellent qualities. What qualities? Qualities of the Buddha, right? Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. So when we read or know these excellent qualities, we get more inspiration and confidence. All right? The triple gem is the object of our confidence in the practice. They inspire us to practice. Inspiration and confidence let one put forth effort in the practice. All right? For this reason, we are encouraged to understand and chant the Ratana Sutta. So you don't chant the Ratasuna just as a, like a parrot. <laughs> you know, a, a parrot can, can, can chant, but he doesn't quite understand. But more important is, do you get inspired by that? Because if you're inspired by, by that, then you put it into practice. Because with your inspiration, you develop faith. And there's faith, faith in the truth of the Buddha. That's why in, in the, you find that it all ends with a saying uh, from para... Uh, third onwards, huh? you look at para third, those of you who have got a copy, by this observation of the truth, may there be happiness. What truth is this? The truth that you, that, you, that you found from listening to the teachings of the Buddha, from understanding the qualities of the Buddha, so that inspiration, all right? so that gives you happiness. All right? So that's called observation of truth. It means that because of your confidence, because of your faith, all right, so you assert, so that, that truth is asserted. So that truth be, becomes so important, becomes part of you. All right, that truth, that truth becomes part of you. It's called asservation of truth. All right? Maybe let's, let's we, we finish the 17 verses, maybe you, you get that. All right? So this is what uh, the, our late chief says. All right? Okay, so this is the background, so I'm going to skip this. Right, so, Vesali, that's the name of the town. Huh? Then, so, An so, Ananda came to the city with the arrival of the Buddha. There were torrential rains that swept away the purifying cups. Right? The city was clean. Right? So, so the, the concept of water. So, there's, there's a lot of uh, imagery there. Imagery. You know the, the concept imagery? Yeah. Oh, they explain imagery. <laughs> Like for example, the concept of torrential rains. What is the concept? What is the imagery of rains? Rain wash away all the all, all the bad things. Huh? Like what is the imagery of light? It brightens up, doesn't it? Brightens up. Right? So that those are called imageries. Huh? So you find that in the text there are a lot of such re references. Okay. The 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 lichavis. The lichavis are the other group of people. Where the Buddha happens to be with, and when they and then he came over, right? So Ananda followed advice, sprinkled the sanctified water from the Buddha's own arms bowl. Right, so that's the background. 
So as a consequence, the evil spirits left and the pestilence subsided. Sometimes it's said that it's plague. Then Ananda returned with the citizens of Vesali to the public hall. They also got town hall, like those days, right? Yeah, where the Buddha and disciples were awaiting his arrival. There the Buddha recited the same discourse on the jewels to the gathering. Discourse on the jewels. Why are they called jewels? Because it's, um, in, the, in India at that time, they, they, they believe that there is this special jewel called the wish-fulfilling jewel. Uh, you know, they believe that it's somewhere maybe hidden at the top of Mount Sumeru, you know, the, the, myth, the myth mythological mountain in, in India. So there's a special jewel where if you can get hold of that jewel, you know, it's, it's like Aladdin's lamb, you know. What, whatever you, you want, whatever you ask for will come true. So it's called a wish-fulfilling jewel. In Pali, it's called Chintamani. Chintamani. Yeah? So wish-fulfilling jewel. So in this discourse, the Buddha is saying that even the chinta money, the wish fulfilling jewel is no match for the three jewels. So if you understand why, then confidence arises, your faith arises. Then you, you say, ah, oh, there is truth in what the Buddha says. So that's called observation of truth. Okay? <coughs> so this is the first verse. Whatever means non humans, right? As I said, the, the word, if you have the Pali text, but I, I thought it wasn't necessary for us to go through the Pali, so it's called Bhutta, B A U T A. Yeah? So, whatever beings are assembled here, terrestrial or celestial, what do you mean by terrestrial or celestial? Hmm. Celestial? Up there. <laughs> yeah, no. In the, you remember just now I mentioned to you about the four, the four heavenly gods, right? So, so and um, it is said that there are a lot of these spirits which are terrestrial. In other words, they are actually living here, not up in the heavens. Uh, huh? You can't see them, is it? Or you want to see them? Your Datuk Kong, or you know, your, your, they, are, they are called in English, tutil, what? Tuti, what is the word? Tutila, tutilatory deities or, or something. Huh? Earth, earthbound de devas, yeah, that's right. Earthbound devas. Sometimes they are found in trees. They are called rakuta devas. Rakuta de devas. Big rocks, you know. Uh, so that is why Buddhists have this belief that, you know, like in the evening, you know, you don't chop down the big trees because that's the time when the devas, the, the tree the devas, they may be coming down to, to, to rest. That could be their, their abodes. Right? That's their, that's their abodes. Right? So you chop off the, the trees, then you may chop off one with their arms. Well, then they come after you. <laughs> all right. Now, the, 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 the devas, all right, just as, for example, the yakas, you know, again, I, I use the word mythology. You know the meaning of myth mythology, right? Myth, right? Myth need not necessarily be true or not true. It's just a myth, right? So there are stories of how, you know, they come in contact with humans. Come in contact with humans. You stories of yakas, you know, having sexual intercourse with humans. <laughs> you know, all, all those kind of, of, of things. Yeah? So, so they have actually the, the ability to interact with humans. Okay? But should we be afraid of them? All right? We should respect them because we don't need to fear them. Why? The, the Buddha says, he who practices the Dhamma is protected by the Dhamma. Right? And he said that the best protection is your precepts. If you keep your precepts well, you don't have to worry. All right? If devas, well, devas will, will say sadhu to you. <laughs> All right? Maybe the... The yakas and the, the naughty ones will not say will not say sadhu, but they will not disturb you. Right? So so Buddhists believe that you don't have to worry. And in another parita called the Dajaga Parita, Dajaga. Dajaga means what? The banner. The banner. You know the banner? You know when you go to war, they always carry a banner, right? Uh, so that's the called Dajaga. So Dajaga Parita or Dajaga Sutta, I think, or Parita, I think. So it is said that if you are worried, if you feel that, you know, maybe, maybe you know, you stay near, I don't know, SS1, you know, every night you want to walk past the cemetery, you know, <laughs> and suddenly you've got goose pimples, you know, and you recite, you, 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 you recite, you know, Namo Tassa, Pakawato, Arahato, Budang Saranang, or if you follow Mahayana, Namo Kwan, Kwan, Kwan Shin, or you are Tibetan, Om Matni Padme Hum, you know, so wha wha whatever it is, but you call upon the name of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Uh, that's a parita. 
for protection. Okay? For protection. So here it says, whatever beings that are here assembled, whether they are terrestrial, on, the, on, 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 on land, on ground, or celestial, there are six heavens. So you see, Buddhists are never bored, you know. Imagine other religions. You do good, when you die, you're born in heaven forever. Only one, you know. And here you've got six to choose from. You can alternate, you know, you're, you're fed up with uh, Chatu Maharaja Jika, I'll go to Tushita. After Tushita, I can go to Tawatimsa. After Tawatimsa, I say, maybe I'll join Mara in Yamaloka. You know? So you, you, have a, you, have, you have a choice, six choice. And in, in the highest of the heavens, you don't even need to do anything. You just think. Yeah, so far, you know, today someone said, go all the way to Penang to buy Loba. Uh, no need. You just sit here, you just think Loba. Then Loba appears. Uh, no, need, no need to go all the way to Penang. Uh, <laughs> right. So, you see, different celestial realms, they've got those powers, the different powers. Okay? Uh, so, uh, whether terrestrial or celestial, may every being be happy and joyful. And also listen attentively to my words. So that's the first verse. Yeah? Okay, let's go on. Second verse. Second verse. O beans. Okay. Listen here, all beans. Shower your loving kindness to those humans who day and night bring offerings to you. Therefore, guard them diligently. Who is the Buddha addressing? The devas, right? So the Buddha is actually telling the devas, please look after, you know, the the human beings because they make offerings to you, isn't it? They make offerings to you, so you take care of them. Shower your loving kindness to those human beings who day and night bring offerings to you. Therefore, you please guard them diligently. So that's the Buddha's advice to the devas. That's the verse two. And verse three. Whatever treasures there may be, either here or in a world beyond, or whatever precious jewels there are in the heavens. You remember I told you chinta money, uh, the, the wish fulfilling jewel. So no matter where you find those jewels, right? Even in the heavens, yet none is comparable to the enlightened one. So even rebirth in the heavens, the jewels in the heavens are nothing compared to, to, to what of the, the enlightened one. You know? There are many stories about heavenly beings. You know? Why are they born in the heavens? They are born in the heavens because of the good deeds that they do. Isn't it? Good deeds, right? In the Salayaka Sutta, the Buddha explains about you need to do ten things. Right? You abstain from all the ten unwholesome ac actions. Quite sure that you'll be born in the, in the heavenly realms. Right? In the he heavenly realms. But that is not the, the ultimate it's not the ultimate because the, 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 the legends say that the devas who are reborn in the heavenly realms, they are reborn there for a long period of time. Very, very long period. So for, for us, we spend how, how, old do, how long do, do, do we live? Now the Yatsik is 92, isn't it? <laughs> right? So, so it, it say our lives spend, okay, give you 100. Oh, the, the, the people in, Akina, in Okinawa, they live, the, the Japanese live pretty long lives. You know? yeah. Yeah. So, say 100 years. 100 years in one of the lower realms could be equivalent to maybe one day. Right? In the higher realm, maybe one hour. You know? So the concept of time. Now, you may think it's strange, right? right? Re recently, I think I told some of you, there was a movie called Interstellar. If you watch that movie, it tells you that actually what the Buddha says is not so far-fetched. Because this guy was going to space, he knew that by the time he comes back, his, his daughter who, was, who just graduated as a scientist in NASA would be dead and gone. Because 10 years, ten years in outer space, in the, in the far galaxy, it could be already 70 years, 80 years on Earth. So now with time, time space concept, People begin to understand, oh, <laughs> what the Buddha said may not be, be that far-fetched. Concept of time, you know. Right? So time is, uh, that's why Einstein, when he first came out, he said time is relative. Re relative. Right? Isn't it? Don't you think so? What's the time now? We are 2.30. <laughs> right? 
this afternoon. But my, my colleagues in Minneapolis, they are fast asleep. My, my colleagues in London, they, 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 they just, just woke up. Isn't it? So is it time? Is, is, in that sense, it's not real. Right? It's, it is real in a conventional sense. That's why in Buddhism, we said there are two levels of truth. Conventional truth, ultimate truth. Right? There's even Pali word for it. Lokiya and Lokutara. Right? So the Buddha was, was very sharp. In fact, the, that's the mind, he, his enlightened mind, he was able to see, see all these things. Okay. So even in the heavens, right? So one may be born in the heavens for, you know, live a long time, but uh, eventually when, when the karma that causes the being to be born in the heavens is about to expire, <laughs> story says that, well, they're supposed to have got fed, have got, uh, what, what they call it, flowers, then the f in their hair, you know, they, 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 they wear very, very nice clothing, you know, very transparent kind, kind, kind of thing. And then they, they sit on very nice cushion, not like this hard, you know, <laughs> so very nice cushion. And when the time is up, then they start fidgeting, you know, then the seat gets very warm, very hot. And then the, the, the flowers, the hair start withering, you know, then they know time is up, then they start, start uh, l l lamenting, say, oh, you know, my time is up. Where do I go after this? Will I be born in the lower realm? Because no, no, nobody actually knows. So they go through this cycle of birth and rebirth and side rebirth. That's why it's called samsara. Huh? You know samsara? Mm, not, not, not your Christian Dior samsara. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. The Malay word is what? Sengsara. You know the Malay word? Sengsara? Bahasa Malaysia? Bahasa Baku. <laughs> Sengsara. Uh. Keadaan saya sekarang sengsara lah. <laughs> Isn't it? Sengsara. Right or not? Uh. So, yet none is comparable to the enlightened one. Right? So if we understand this, then we say, oh, so our faith will, will arise. Is this faith blind faith? But this faith is based on an, an, an understanding, right? So in the Buddha is this precious jewel found. So that's the Buddha. Right? So on account of this truth, may there be well-being. Right? So always it's a repeat, it's an observation of truth. Yeah? Verse 4, uh, the tranquil sage of the Sakyas realized secession, freedom from passion, deathlessness and excellence. So this is uh, verse 4, okay. Uh, there's nothing comparable to this Dhamma. The earlier verse 3 is about the Buddha, right? All right so now it's about the Dhamma. So there's nothing comparable to this Dhamma. In the Dhamma is this precious jewel found. On account of this truth, may there be well-being. Now, first the word, the word Buddha, I think we all know who the Buddha is, right? The word Buddha comes from the root word Bodhi, which means knowledge, isn't it? Knowledge. So that's why it's called the all-knowing one. Okay? The word Dhamma, you know where, where, what, what is the root word of Dhamma? Dar, Dareti, Dareti. It means to support, to support. That's the original, that's the root word, root word. In English, we say etymology. You know, Malay say what? Kata dasa, you know, the, the root word. That means the root word of the word Dharma means that which supports. Now, the Dharma supports us in what way? Supports us in our path, in our spiritual path. So that's why it's called the Dharma. Okay? So, the tranquil sage of the Sakyas, Tranquil means he's very calm, right? Because he's enlightened, his mind, he has purified. Why is he called sage of the Sakyas? You know sage? The Chinese Buddhists and Tibetan Buddhists like to use the word Sakyamuni. Huh? You know Sakyamuni? Have you heard of Sakyamuni? Uh, Sakyamuni is not a person's name. You know? it's, not his, it's not his name. Sakyamuni is not his name. Sakyamuni means... Com comprises two words, Sakya and Muni. What is Muni? Sakya, you, you know, right? That he's born into that tribe, Sakyas, like Teochew, Hokkien, Hakka, you know, right? and then they got sub sects, right? sub clans, you know. So he's born into the Sakya clan. But he's called the sage of the Sakyas. He's, you know, sage, wise man. So s Muni means wise man. <laughs> So Sakya Muni means the wise man. But actually the word Muni, the, the original meaning, the root word means the silent one. 
the silent sage. That where sometimes you, you read in certain translations, they describe the Buddha as the silent sage. Why is he silent? Well, you just heard that he taught for 45 years, he must have taught a lot. <laughs> How can he be silent? So this, this is again a metaphorical term. Silent in the sense that whatever he say, he speak with a thunderous silence. <laughs> thunderous silence. You know thunderous You know the meaning of thunderous? Very loud. Can silence be very loud? So this is a play on, it's a paradox. Uh, like silence speaks louder than words. There you go. Silence speaks louder than words. Uh, so you are like, like Sakyamuni. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly the, the meaning. That's why in, the, in one of the Mahayana Sutra called the Diamond Sutra, Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Chedika Sutra, uh, Vajra Chedika Sutra. In the Diamond Sutra, it says, even though the Buddha spoke so much, yet he did not say, he did not utter a single word. Or when he speak, he speak with a thunderous silence. The difference is because whatever we say are all concepts. When we have concepts, our words are always rooted in our views, our arguments. This morning I mentioned those of you who were here that the Buddha only makes statements. Statements are either true or false. But we don't make statements most of the time. We make arguments. <laughs> you, you see, that's, that's the difference. And arguments are not true or false. Arguments are, no, no, valid or invalid. <laughs> they are different. Right? If you understand basic logic, they are actually very different. So it is said that the Buddha doesn't argue with you. He just tells you, this is the way. This is what I've discovered. If you want to follow this way, please do it. Find out for yourself. That's why ehi pasiko. Right, come and find out for yourself. Because the Buddha spent six years trying to find the truth, he discovered the truth, he laid bare the, 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 the truth. In the final discourse, he said, the Buddha does not have the clenched fist of a master. He's always open. You see? Why? Because what he discovered is the truth. There's, there's no point trying to hide the, the, the truth. So he shows it to you. Okay? So he's called the sage of the Sakyas. Sakya Muni. Right? He realized secession, freedom from passion, deathlessness, and excellence. What is this secession? Secession from what? Cravings, right? Isn't it? Four noble truths? Cravings, isn't it? Cravings. What is it that causes us to be born again and again? It's our cravings. It's our cravings. We make a wrong wish. <laughs> Then you must, you must edit it, like, may all your positive, wholesome wishes come, come true. Uh, or that's also important, you know, because you need merits, you know. You need merits for this life and future life until you finally attain enlightenment. You see? Because merits are very important. Punya, you know punya? Uh, the Buddha says there are three bases of merits. Punya, kiriya, vada. Punya. How do you make merits? Dana, sila, bhavana. How do you make merits? How do you make merits? Or oh, sila, bhavana, uh, no, dana, sila, ba, ba, bhavana. Dana is generosity, uh, precepts, and, uh, dana, and, and meditation, and mind training. Right? So you need that. You need, you need punya. Right? You need punya. No punya, you think you'll be able to sit here and listen to Dhamma talk? No. You are the fact that all of you are able to sit here and listen to Dhamma talk. And I have sufficient punya to be able to talk to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. It's, isn't it? We all we don't have punya. Because can you imagine there are people who, you know, by four o'clock they have to go out, maybe set up a, a, a stall, you know, to, to earn a living for the e evening. We are all very fortunate. We don't have to do that. Right? Okay. So that's called realize secession. Secession from cravings. Right? That's the second noble truth, isn't it? Correct? Second, second noble truth. Freedom from passion, all right. Uh, and what else you have? Uh, deathlessness and excellence. So all this is actually describing nibbana. These are characteristics of nibbana, all right? Characteristics of nibbana. So there's nothing comparable to this dhamma. So in this dhamma is this precious jewel found. On account of this truth, may there be well-being. 
So here the Buddha is explaining the, the characteristics of, of, uh, of, of Nibbana. Right? Nibbana is an end of, is a cessation, cessation of suffering, cessation of cravings. It's a freedom from passions. Passion here, like for example, greed, hatred, delusion. So freedom from, from those. Deathlessness? What is the meaning of deathlessness? There's no more reaper. There's no more re reaper. There's birth, there's death, and there's deathlessness. <laughs> and excellence. It's power, excellence. So maybe the first four words, uh, secession, freedom can be positive. Deathlessness sounds, sounds positive or negative, but excellence is described as Nibbana is positive. Now, Nibbana, if you read the, the, the Buddhist scriptures, it tends to give you the impression that it's, it's negative. It's the end of this, end of that. Right? But there are also positive expressions of Nibbana. Nibbana is called Nibbana Paramang Sukang. Nibbana Paramang Sukang. What does that even mean? Nibbana is the highest bliss. You see, so Nibbana is expressed in a positive way. Sometimes Nibbana is expressed in an analogy. Nibbana, you cross over to the other shore. Or Nibbana is like the cool cave. You know, a cave is, is a cave supposed to be very cool, right? Cool, pleasant, nice. It's not the cave that you have in Afghanistan where, where the, or, or somewhere bin, bin, bin Laden used to stay. <laughs> not those caves. Right? So in the Buddhist terminology, caves are very nice, you know, very calm, very cooling, very, you know, very peaceful caves, right? All right, so those are actually expressions of Nibbana. So as you read the text, Nibbana not necessarily be, be negative. So there are positive ex expressions of it. Right? Okay, that's verse 4. So verse 4 is on Dhamma. Now verse 5 is also Dhamma. The Supreme Buddha extols a path of purity. What is this path of purity? Noble Eightfold Path. Calling it the path uh, which unfailingly yeah, if you have the text, because this is a summary. <laughs> this, the, the one, do you, do you have a copy of this now? You all have, right? Okay, so I'll, I'll read it. What I have on the, trans on the PowerPoint is, a sum, is a, just a point only. Yeah, it's the same thing, right? So, uh, where are we? Verse 4. Oh, the, the slide. Oh, I haven't changed the slide. Okay, okay. So, no, never mind. Must, must be my, my jet lag. <laughs> okay, the Supreme Buddha extol a path of purity, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, calling it the path which unfailingly brings concentration. That is not comparable to this concentration. This precious jewel is the Dhamma. So concentration. Yeah. So this is, say that the pure concentration, the Buddha, Supreme Buddha praise is described as concentration without interruption. There's nothing like that. Concentration. Now, this concentration is concentration found in where? What type of concentration is the Buddha talk, talking about? Jhanas, yes, but from, from where? Because vipassana is, <laughs> yeah, vipassana is inside, right? But we here Buddha used the word concentration, and be, before that, there's this word, Noble Eightfold Path. So it's the concentration that is found in the Noble Eightfold Path. Because, yeah. Samas are samadhi because there are different types of con concentration. Because you can have right concentration, you can have wrong concentration. Correct or not? Uh, you can concentrate your mind very well, and you know, be like the rocket man. You know, uh, you know. <laughs> you know, you know. Don Donald Trump called the North Korean leader the rocket man. A lot of concentration, make make rockets. Yeah, you you can make rockets. There's a lot. You you, you think you can make rockets without concentration? Yeah, look at those scientists, you know, who spend days and nights, you know, trying to develop weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> you need concentration. But is that the concentration that the Buddha is talking about? No. That's why the Buddha mentioned that. The concentration. Uh, he says, the Supreme Buddha extolled a path of purity, the noble eightfold path, calling a path which brings which unfailingly brings concentration. Right? Okay. Likewise, you know, in the Noble Eightfold Path, after concentration, what is that, the next one? What, what is the next in the Noble Eightfold Path, after concentration, or before con concentration? Huh? No, understanding right at the beginning. 
Concentration right towards the end. Huh? Mindfulness, right? Mindfulness, right? Samasati and Samasamadhi, right? So concentration, concentration, mindfulness and effort become as one group. Correct, not? As, as one group. So now, mindfulness. Can we have wrong mind mindfulness? Of course, you can have wrong mi mindfulness. Again, when you talk about mindfulness, we're talking about mindfulness in the Noble Eightfold Path. Right? Today, <laughs> mindfulness is such a fashionable term, such a fashionable, uh, uh, I, I don't know, such a fashionable practice or in, in the West that people use mindfulness for a whole range of things which the, the, the Buddha would be quite shocked, you know. <laughs> for example, in the U.S. Army, the, 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 the recruits are trained how to be mindful when you are snipers, you know, snipers? How to shoot people, how to kill people. You need mindfulness and concentration. Is that not my mindfulness? Of course it's my mindfulness. But is that the mindfulness that is found in the Eightfold Path? So it's not the kind of my mindfulness, right? Okay? And uh, in corporate America, corporate America, if you read one of the Eastern Horizon, I, I interviewed one of the consultants from Mac McKinsey in, in New York. So he says that he learns, he's a consultant for McKinsey, you know McKinsey? One of the, 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 the consulting firm. He works for Mac McKinsey, but he learns Vipassana, but he also realized that he can actually use mindfulness in, in his work, and it makes him a good consultant. Of course, he doesn't harm people, right? But that mindfulness by itself is not really the noble eightfold path kind of mindfulness, even though it has got beneficial e effects. You know, uh, it helps him to make make good money for Mac for Mac for McKinsey. You know, and McKinsey is promoting mindfulness. Right. right, University of California, Los Angeles. There's a center of mindfulness study. Not everybody are Buddhist there, right? so they've used mindfulness in a very broad range. It all started because of this, this gentleman, John Kabat-Zinn, yeah, who used mindfulness to treat stress patients. That's so why he created what is called MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Techniques. Of course, for a good cause. Right? Many, he found that many patients, uh, they were able to actually uh, become better after applying mind, mind, mindfulness. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm not saying that you should not do, do that. Right? But not to be trained to be a sniper, of course. That's, that's, but that's what's ha happening. So when, when all these values are not grounded in sila, you see, that's where it goes off. Right? That's why the Buddha says, sila samadhi panya, isn't it? Right? In the West, people are fascinated with meditation, mind training. Probably if you are you are studying one of the Ivy League universities, you know, when you meet, you say, hey, how's your meditation today? You know, have you reached first jhana? So, you know, but you talk to them about precept, nah, we don't want precepts. We just want meditation and concentration. You see? So that's, that's, the, that's, the, the, that's the situation. Yeah? So we must be very careful. So concentration, yes, is important, but we must always make sure it's grounded in the Noble Eightfold Path. Of course, we, we don't have time to look into the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah? but you know what, what that means. Then six, uh, then it talks about the eight persons, right? What are these eight persons? <laughs> these eight, <laughs> you see, Indian arithmetic, uh, four times two equals eight. You know? <laughs> so the eight individuals, okay, let's, let's read the, the actual... The eight persons extolled by virtuous men constitute four pairs. We understand that, right? First of all, uh, literally we understand that eight persons, of course four pairs. Huh? Four times two is eight, man. You, you can count, right? <laughs> we understand that, right? Uh, the second stage is to see what actually these eight individuals are. They are the disciples of the Buddha and are worthy of offerings. I think in the Pali there it's the Savakas. Savakas, right? So they are the disciples of the Buddha and are worthy of offerings. You know when you, you recite the virtues of the Sangha, also nine virtues, I, I think, yeah? is it nine? Yeah, maybe nine, yeah. Yeah, Supatipano, you know, the Supatipano, Bhagavato, yeah? the Supatipano, Nya Nya Patipano, all those. So you find that they are an incomparable field of merits. Uh, just now, remember, I was talking about Punya, Punya, Punya Kiriya. Yeah? So 
So it is said that the, 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 the Sangha is the, these eight individuals, four pairs, are praised by those at peace. They are worthy of offerings, are disciples of the Buddha. Gifts given to them yield abundant fruit. In the Sangha is this precious jewel found. Now, what is this Sangha? Sangha means what? Community, right? So here, the, during the Buddha's time, the Buddha differentiates two types of Sangha, correct? What we call the conventional Sangha and the Arya Sangha or absolute Sangha or ultimate Sangha. What is a conventional Sangha? Your monastic Sangha. Monastic Sangha. The monks that, that, you know, in, that you see in the temples, right? So, uh, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, right? They are called, uh, yes, they are members of the Sangha, but they are the conventional Sangha. Samuti Sangha, yeah. Samuti Sangha, right? Samuti, that means conventional Sangha. Samuti Sangha and Arya Sangha. These two terms, right, Buddha used, right? Samuti, we translate as conventional. Arya, you can translate as enlightened Sangha, if you want, or the noble Sangha. What's the, what's the difference? The conventional sangha are just the monks, the nuns who have uh, ordained, observed precepts. If you follow the Theravada, then if he's a fully ordained monk, he would observe 227 precepts. Right? If he follows the Chinese Mahayana, maybe more than that, 250, maybe even more. Right? So they observe precepts. They are called monastic sangha. Now, who then falls into the, this sangha, Arya sangha? So in the, in the Buddhist text, it is says that to become an enlightened being, you see the word savaka just now? I, I told you the, the, the disciples. When the disciple is enlightened, there is a, there's a stage. It's a four stage. First stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage. Uh, so they have got the technical names. Uh, the stream enterer, he enters the stream. <laughs> the stream, right? He enters the stream. Remember, those of you who are here this morning, I said sometimes the Buddha equates his teaching like, like going against, against the stream. Because it's not easy, it's difficult. Right? But there are people who enter the, the, the stream. That means they have really gone through it. They have, they have achieved what is called a breakthrough. You heard of this word, Abhiya Samaya? Abhiya Samaya, it means a breakthrough. So they have made a breakthrough. <laughs> okay? Make a breakthrough. So then, they have called a stream enterer. Okay? We will not have time to go into the details, but basically a stream enterer is someone who has knocked off three of the ten defilements. One is he no longer have any doubt in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. His faith, his confidence in the Buddha is unshakable. Right? Possible? Uh, then, then they probably they will not be able to, to follow, the, follow the Eightfold Path if they are cr cr Christian. You see, Christian is a title. Yeah, yeah. If a person labeled as Christian but he, he, he embarks on the Eightfold Path, all right, then, then he may jolly well uh, attain the first, be a stream, stream winner. And, he w and labels to him doesn't matter whether it's Christian or Buddhist, you know, isn't it? But the important thing is the Eightfold Path. Yeah, he followed it, the full path. If, if you say he's a Christian, if you still have this concept of, of God is the ultimate, not the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, then he, then how could he, he won't be that from the Buddhist perspective. He could be a very good Christian. There's, there's, there's no, no question about that. Yeah? But we are talking here from the, the Buddhist perspective. From Buddhist perspective, if you want to be a stream enterer, it doesn't matter whether you call yourself Christian or Muslim. As long as you, you follow the Eightfold Path, all right, you practice it, you study, you practice it, and, and, and you, you realize these three, these three things, then you are, you are called a stream, stream enterer. Right? Stream and enterer. Okay? So that's the first, the, the, the first one. So he has no more doubts about the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. He no longer has this illusion of that there is a permanent self. Right? He no longer has this attachment to rites and rituals. Right? A Christian could jolly well be someone who who have discarded all this attachment to rites and, and rituals. You know, there are some Christians who are mystics, you know, who doesn't believe in all these rites and, and rituals. And there are also cr cr Christians who call themselves Christians, but who doesn't believe that, that there's this permanent soul. Possible, is it? Right. But whether they have that faith, that confidence, that what the Buddha taught is, is correct, that's, that, I, that we would not know, only they, they would know. 
So if they really have that, that, that faith, that unshakable knowledge and confidence, then, then they, they could be well on that path. Okay? Then, of course, then it goes on the second, third, fourth. So there are four stages, all right? Each one, the, the Buddha says, eight, eight, the four pairs. First pair is the person who enters the eightfold path and then he reaps the fruits. So there's one pair. Uh, it's, it's one, one pair. Yeah, so when you, when you, you divide four, four times two, eight. <laughs> so there are eight in, in individuals, but actually there are four pairs. First pair is, say, a stream enterer, a person who enters the, the stream, and then he, he reaps the, 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 the fruits. The, the, the fruit is the second one. Then, he en- then the, the second, the sakadagami, right? Then he, and he enters. Then he reaps the fruits of it. So that's the second pair. The third pair, the anagami, he enters. He realizes the fruit. That's the third pair. The fourth one, he enters. And then he breaks off. He destroys all the five defilements, including the earlier five, all the ten defilements. So that's the fruits. Then he's called the fourth pair. Uh, no, D- during the during the Buddha's time, the like the what well, you say, King, like you say, King Bimbisara, uh, not King Bimbisara, Ananta Pindika, you know, and and a few other lay lay people, they attain the first stage, and some some people attain second stage, third stage. Yeah. Uh, now na- nowadays even monks are so very difficult to become <laughs> one more lay people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are worthy because it's so difficult to, to attain. That's why they are, they are worthy in that sense. So if one is able to, uh, to become one of them, that's why it becomes worthy. If everybody can become them, mm, it's no longer special. No, no. Here, the, the noble, the, the ordinary monks or people like, like us, we are all as- aspiring. We are all as- aspiring. So we are, we, we are noble in the sense that or we are worthy in the sense that if we, as, if we attempt, we aspire. But we are not the highest in terms of the, the nobleness because we have not achieved it. Uh, so, so that's why we are not a jewel yet. Yeah. So the Buddhist practice is, is a path. It's for us to, to, to continue, continue. So along, along the path. Right? So that's why you say ordinary beings. Huh? There's one called, uh, we just we use putu jana, right? You heard of the word putu jana? So there are two types of putu janas. Uh, one is called the blind putujanas. Uh, one is called the kalyana putujanas. The, the, the one, the dharma friend putujana. So if you are a human being who doesn't observe precepts, who doesn't you know, practice kindness and all that, again, it could be a Christian, it could be a Muslim, it could be a Hindu, right? So then you fall into what is called a blind putujana. But if you are someone who is kind, hearted, compassionate, you know, you, 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 you volunteer, in, in, you know, to help the poor people, not necessarily Buddhists, but it could be Christian, Hindus, then you become a noble putujanas or a kalyana putujana. But you are not worthy of the highest offerings yet because you have not reached them. Because it's difficult. That's why it becomes so precious in that sense. Uh, in that sense uh. But your question is, not many people can achieve it. I think I agree with you. <laughs> Right? But this is where Buddhists have got this faith that we not only have one life, we've got many more lives. <laughs> like a god like that. Huh? And, yeah. Sometimes some they're, they're not worthy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, sometimes I, I think... <laughs> Lay, that's why lay people need to, un- to understand how to, how to appreciate the monk, how to respect the monk, but you don't overdo it. No. You know? I, I think so, sometimes we, I wouldn't like to use the but I think we over pamper the monks. Uh. You know? I think we should, we should respect the, the monks. We regard the, the monks as a moral conscience for, for us, as a good example. Right? So when we see a monk, of course we, we respect them, because they don the yellow robes, the yellow robes represents the sankha, and we give them the benefit of doubt that they are observing 227 precepts. But whether it is 227 or just seven, I mean, <laughs> it's not for us to judge, right? 
If they undertake that and yet they don't practice it, whose karma? It's their karma, not our karma. It's not our karma. But because they wear the yellow robes, so we respect them. We don't have time, but in the discourses, there are many examples where the Buddha says, how should you deal with monks who are not practicing the, the, the Dharma? Do you take a stick and whack them or chase them away? Or there are also many examples the Buddha mentioned. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, there, there are many. We won't have time. Uh, you, you can, uh, if you want, I, I, can sh- I can give you a few of the, su- the suttas. So lay people need to understand how to relate to the monks. Very Im- important. Yeah? I think that is l- lacking. Right? We, we should really know how to relate to the monks. Okay, we will run through. Otherwise, we will we'll start in verse 6. <laughs> okay, I want to finish. So you all right now? Eight individuals, four pairs? Yeah? So this is on the Eightfold Path. Eh? That means they practice the Eightfold Path and then they attain the, the four stages of enlightenment. Stage one, stage two, stage three. So each attain first stage, first pair. Second stage, second pair. Third stage, third pair. Fourth stage, fourth pair. Okay. <coughs> With a steadfast mind and applying themselves well in the dispensation of the Buddha Gautama, Free from defilements, they have attained to that we should be attained, arahanship, encountering deathless. They enjoy the peace of Nibbana, freely obtained. This precious jewel is the Sankha. So it's a bit like what I, I mentioned just now. Because they have now, uh, they are now free from defilements, you see? They are free of passion and free from the, the, the defilements. They have attained to that we should be attained. And plunging into deathlessness, what is deathlessness? Enjoy the peace of ni- 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 Nibbana. So Nibbana is also described as peace. So described in a positive way. Right? Not, not that Nibbana is the blowing out, the end of everything. Nibbana is peace. right? So they enjoy the, the, the peace in absolute freedom. <laughs> absolute fr- freedom. <coughs> so this is the Sankha. Okay, let's, let's go on. Verse 8. Ah. <coughs> as a post in the text, uh, as opposed deep planted in the earth stands unshaken by the winds from the four quarters. So too, I declare, is the righteous man who comprehends with wisdom the noble truth. This precious jewel is a sankha. Okay? So, verse, this verse is still talking about uh, the sankha, right? So here they are saying that the, the sankha is like a post deep, like a firm post sunk in the earth. Huh? City post. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So so it be so so stable, right? So you cannot shake it, right? You cannot shake. It. I think in the Pali version is called Indra post. Indra post. Right? Indra. Remember, I told you, Saka is another word for Indra. So they call Indra post. So it's sung in the earth. Cannot be shaken by the four winds. You know what are the four winds? The winds four different directions. Four different directions. Yeah. Here, I think they are not talking about the eight winds. <laughs> talking about the four winds. In other words, the pole is so strong that whether wind comes from the north, south, east, west, will, will not shake it. Yeah. So even if you have a bomb cyclone, you still be there. <laughs> right. So I say that a righteous person who thoroughly perceives the noble truth is similar to that. In the Sankha is this precious jewel found. So ultimately... The, the Sankha, right, at the highest level, the Arahat, right? The, the Arahat. So the, in the Theravada tra- tradition, the ideal is the Arahat. So someone who has eradicated 10 defilements. 10 defilements, right? Okay, the, the, by the time, the, and the defilements will include things like conceit, you know, restlessness, and uh, ignorance, and, and, and all those things. Verse 9. <coughs> Those who realize the noble truth, well taught by him, who is profound in wisdom, that is the Buddha, even though they may be ex- exceedingly heedless, they may not take an eighth existence in the realm of sense fears. Ah, okay, let me explain this. This precious jewel is the Sankha. So by this assumption of truth, may there be happiness. Now. <coughs> With his enlightenment, three qualities are now abandoned. 
wrong belief in selfhood, doubt and attachment to rites and rituals. He is absolutely freed from the four states of misery and is, is incapable of committing the six major wrongdoings. So who, who, who is the Buddha referring to here? The first stage, right? So he has eradicated uh, three fetters. Remember there were ten, right? Altogether ten, but the first stage he eradicated three. So what are these three? Wrong belief in selfhood, right? He understands that what we regard as a self is actually nothing but just aggregates. You know, the, 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 the Buddhist co concept is that what we call a, a person is actually nothing but just mind and matter. Just a combination of mental properties, physical properties. And what is mental properties? Consciousness, perceptions, feelings and mental formations, right? And then the, and then the body will be the elements. Earth, you know, it's a very common language, earth elements, water element, wind element, and uh, what is the other one? Earth, water, fire, and air. <laughs> so, so these are the, the elements. So that makes what we call a, hu a human being. But when you separate them, you can't see a human being. During the Buddha's time, the Buddha used the analogy of the chariot. The chariot. Or, or we use today's analogy. We say that's a car, that's an automobile. That car exists only because you put the four wheels together, the bonnet in, the tyres are in, the, the steering wheel is, is there, the windscreen is there, you know, the seats are, are, are there, the doors are there, the engine is there, everything is there, you said that's a car. But the moment you, you, re, you remove the four tyres, you remove the wheels on one side, you remove the steering wheel, you remove the doors, you remove the seats, you remove the engine, now I ask you, where's the car? There's no car. So the car is just a concept. It's a conventional term that we use to describe a collective entity. A collective entity. So these this mental properties and physical properties, when it comes together, conventionally we say, oh, it's a human being. But in the Buddhist, uh, like the, uh, the Abhidhamma, they say it's just actually, it's just mind, and matter. But then we can't go around calling you mind and matter, right? We've got to give you a name. You see? Right. Even if we call you mind and matter, it has, to, after a while, you say mind and matter one, mind and matter two. You see? <laughs> so you still have to make some differentiations. Right? So that being the case, we give a name. The, the spirit from the, in the, you read some of the Buddhist texts, they explain actually people mistake it for, for the soul. For the soul. Alright? That is why the Buddha teaches the concept of no soul. So, which is a major departure from all other religions. Alright? That's why it's called anatta. Atta is soul. Anatta means no soul. Alright? Where's the, where's the, 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 the soul? Alright? Uh, Okay, is it? Hang on, put it the, the, the other way. Uh, now, the scholarly argument, whether the Buddha says there's no soul or the, the, or the Buddha says there's no permanent soul. <laughs> so, we, I don't think we have time to, to enter into that. But if you want, you read the uh, Anatta Lakana Sutta. Is it the second or the third the discourse? Second the, the discourse. The second discourse taught by the Buddha is called the concept of the, the discourse on non self. Where the Buddha asked the, asked the, the monk, okay, what do you call a mind or oh, feeling? Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Feeling is in, impermanent. Can you control feelings? You can't co control feeling. All right? This body, is it permanent or impermanent? It's impermanent. Can you tell your body, don't grow old? You can't. So that being the case, is there something that's, that's in you that's permanent that you can control? You can't. Everything is in a flux. In a flux, everything changes. So that being the case, the Buddha says, there's nothing you can call, call as yours, as mine. You, 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 you understand? So there's nothing you can say is mine because you can't hold on to it. What can you hold on? 
Your feelings. Can you hold on to your feelings? You can't. Perception. You can't. Right? By the time you are in your late 60s, 70s, your perception is so getting worse. You can see now already. Oh. Oh. He said, then you say, oh, looks like him but not him. <laughs> Something like that. Oh. He said, it's a perception. Isn't it a perception at play? Yeah. It's a perception at play. All right? So this concept of spirit is what the Buddhists would call soul. So it's a... It's a it's a creation. Wapola Rahula, the one who wrote What the Buddha Taught, one of the best books. If you, if you are new to Buddhism, I recommend you to read this book, What the Buddha Taught. Not, not What the Buddha Really Taught. There's another book called What the Buddha Really Taught. <laughs> it's What the Buddha Taught. Wapola Rahula. He says, actually, men create two things. You know, One is, for self-protection, he creates God. And then for self-preservation, he creates soul. Soul, soul, the concept of a soul. For self protection, if you look at the, the origin of how religions began, uh, it's always, God is always manly. Uh, right? Uh, uh, because they have to be strong, so they have to protect the, the tribes. Except in Southeast Asia, because of the, 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 the feminine side. You see? And then, but then, despite God being able to give you protection, people still die. But they said, surely. They just don't disappear. Surely when people die, there's something in them that don't die. Oh, it's a soul. And what happened to this soul? So after the person dies, this soul goes back to God. You see? So this, so Wapola Rahula, I don't think that's his theory, but I think he quote a lot of sociologists and, and, and anthropologists who have studied society, how society develops. So he created this too. And that seems to explain the, the Buddhist position, why we reject the concept that there is a permanent soul. In it. Okay? I think I have to go on. For self-preservation, we create soul. For details, read Wapola Rahula. <laughs> Alright? Okay, so these three. Uh, so it's absolutely free. Four states of misery. What are four states of misery? Very quickly. If you look at the four states of mi misery, I think it's the, it's the notes there. Mm. Okay, if the, only the six. Okay, the four the four states of misery. What what did they? Hell realms, animal realms, asura realms, ghost realms, beta realms. So these are called the realms of misery. Okay, and then the six major wrongdoings is mentioned there. I think in your notes, uh, it includes killing of father, killing of mother, causing a schism in the sangha, uh, wounding a Buddha. Uh, killing an arahan, and I think the last one is what having wrong views or something, <laughs> right? False views, uh, false views. Okay, so six wrong wrongdoings. Okay, right. So eleven, he is incapable of hiding whatever evil he does, whether by deed, word, or thought, for it has been said that such an act is impossible for one who has seen the path. So in the Sankha is this precious jewel found. So this is still on the, the, the Sankha. So the enlightened being, the Sankha, he is incapable of hiding whatever evil he does. <laughs> whatever by deed, word, or... Thing. Now, who, who, who could this possibly be? S say a Sotapan. A Sotapan has only eradicated three things. Can a Sotapan still be... be can, can a Sotapan still commit some... Some transgression? Possible. Yeah. All right. He may not, for example, c commit very grave, uh, like killing people, but he, he, he may get, uh, he may be very impatient, he may have anger. All right. Because he has not eradicated that. He only eradicated three things. <laughs> you see? The concept of self, non attachment to rites and rituals, and, and uh, the doubt. You see? So it's, it's possible. But even if he does it, he will not try to hide it. All right? If it is a monk, then every two weeks there what is called a confession. Uh, right? But lay people, we don't have this tradition like the Catholics have conf confession. You go to you go to the room there, you know, and then you tell the old oh, father, you know, I, I, I you know, <laughs> you know I, I've, I've seen, you know. <laughs> right? So we don't have that. But uh, I think in the we can we can mention to our Kalyana Mitas. Or you have a teacher 
Then you can talk to your teacher, oh, you know, I think I've broken this precept, you know. But, but then you see, breaking precept is not that, ah, you did this, then you, you have sinned, you know. Then the monk will not say, oh, my son, you have sinned. <laughs> you know, it's not that. Because that means you try to make sure that you don't do it again. Put that aditana, that determination that you will not do it. But first you have to acknowledge. So you will not hide it. Right? You will not hide it. It is said that the word arahan. Is it the word arahan? The A seems like a prefix. Rahan. Rahan. So rahan sounds like rasya. Rasya. You know the Malay word for rasya? Uh, secret. So you don't keep secrets. So arahans, they, they don't keep secrets. You know? Arahans are not, they, they don't have the same capability like the Buddha to be able to teach. They may even be able to, they may possibly give a wrong meditation technique because they don't have the same kind of uh, wide uh, knowledge like, the, like the, the, the Buddha. So they may make those kind of mistakes. Right? Okay? So they say that he's incapable of hiding whatever evil he does. Evil sounds a very strong word. Huh? Right? Okay, but the, is this the word you see? Wrongdoing, uh, wrongdoing, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a minor wrong deed or, or something, right? Mm. And any evil action based, yeah. Yes, okay. So it is said that the, he, 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 will, he will not hide, right? But I think if people like us, right, we did so something wrong, uh, well, we try to hide as much as we can. Uh. Hopefully, nobody find out, right? <laughs> right? That's, that's our nature, right? So here he's trying to, to say that we are different. That is why if one is like that, so it's worthy of, worthy of, of veneration. No? But we, because we are not there, so we are not so, so worthy. No? <laughs> okay. Get a, get a free drink. Okay. Uh, just like a forest crown in full blossom in the first month of the summer season. This is in India. I, I don't know whether how, what this means. So has the sublime doctrine that leads to the Nibbana been taught for the highest good of beings? So this is referring to the Buddha now. So look at it. Uh, here the translation is, As the woodland grows true in the early heat of the summer month, a crown with blossoming flowers, even so is the sublime Dhamma leading to the calm of Nibbana, which is taught by the Buddha for the highest good. Okay? So here again, is describing Nibbana in a very positive way, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Uh, then verse 13. The peerless, excellent one, the Buddha, the knower of Nibbana, the giver of Nibbana, the bringer of the noble path, taught the excellent Dhamma. This precious jewel is the Buddha. By this observation of truth, made there. Okay. So here... The, the summary, the peerless, excellent one. Peerless in the sense he has got no peer, no, no one to compare with. Yeah? The knower, he's knower, he knows, he gives, he brings, <laughs> bringer of the excellent. All right? Now, what does he give? <laughs> he gives? He gives the teachings, right? he brings the excellent paths. It is said that the, the, it, like one of the qualities of the Dhamma is it is excellent in the beginning, excellent in the middle, and excellent in the end. <laughs> right? So it is excellent in, in that sense, the bringer of the excellent, bringer of the, the Dhamma. Right? So here he's referring to the, the it is what the Buddha has brought. Right? Isn't it? Right, now we say, Swakato, Pakawata, Dhammo, Sanditiko, Akaliko, Ehi Pasiko, Opanayiko, Pachatang, Vedi, Tabo, Vinyuhiti. Right? So the six qualities. So he has, he has brought the excellent. So he expounded the sublime Dhamma. So the sublime Dhamma, if you read your, your text, Swakato Pakawato Dhamma. Well taught is the Dhamma, isn't it? That's the meaning, right? Swakato Pakawata Dhammo. You read your six virtues. The first line is actually to say that the Dhamma is well taught. Right? Expounded the sublime Dhamma. Well expounded. Okay? Then you got the five characteristics. Okay? Verse 14, their past is extinct, a new beginning there is not. Their minds are not attached to a future birth. Their desires do not grow. Those wise ones with their seeds of becoming destroyed go out even as this lamb does. In the Sankha is this precious jewel found on account of this truth, may that be, be well-being. Now this one also loaded with, with a lot of uh, 
meaning, right? We can, we can, we can take this verse and spend one hour <laughs> talking about it. So now we're going to rush through it, right? Now, what does it mean here? Their past is extinct. That means uh, exhausted. The karma is exhausted. Uh, uh, this is a very complicated topic, right? We always thought that do good karma, right? Avoid bad karma. But there's also one way we said avoid doing good and bad karma. <laughs> Have you heard of that? All right, that's topic for another, another s- s- session, right? Because there's a, there's a discourse called the Kukura Vatika Sutta. Kukura Vatika Sutta. The dog ascetic sutta. Huh? Some of you may have heard of that. The Kukura Vatika Sutta. Where the Buddha says there are four types of actions. Good karma that leads to good actions. Bad karma that leads to bad... Sorry. Good karma that leads to good results. Bad karma that leads to bad results. Good karma and bad karma leads to good and bad results. And... Neither good karma nor bad karma leads to neither good nor bad results. <laughs> and that the fourth one is the end of karma. That's where you make karma extinct. But in order to achieve the fourth one, you have to do a lot of good karma. <laughs> All right. All right. So as I said, remember I told today is just an appetizer, right? <laughs> so there are a lot, a lot of things. So when Achan Brahmali comes, please, you've got four days with him, right? Please ask him. Uh, then, at the end of it, probably you'll be stream enter after that. <laughs> okay. All right. So, past is extinct. Okay. A new beginning. There is not. There's no more rebirth. In the when the Buddha, when Prince Siddhartha became the Buddha, he says, "This house, house builder, no more. I can. I know who you are. You can build no more house. Remember the the, the expression. So their minds are not attached to a future birth. Our minds are." Because at a point before we pass away, just now over, over lunch, someone asked, is the last thought moment important? Important or not important? We always have three cravings. What cravings do we have just before we, we, we die? <laughs> Craving for existence. All right? Of course, happy existence. La. <laughs> we don't crave to be born as a cockroach. You know? We're craving for good existence. Craving for non-existence. Craving for existence, craving for non, 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 non existence. And what is the third one? Sensuous. Craving for sense, sense pleasures. So we always have these three, three, three cravings. They're very strong at, at, at our, just before, before we, we pass away. So that is why mind training comes in to help us to, 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 to let go. That's why sometimes you read stories about Tibetan lamas or, or not necessarily Tibetan, any, any great um, med- meditators, you know, before they die, they, they, they had, they are very calm, very peaceful. You know, they are not worried. You know, <laughs> but I think we all are. <laughs> okay, so their past is a new beginning. There is not their minds are not attached to the future. Their desires do not grow. Uh, no more cravings, because our desires, our de- desires for the three, three things here, are like cravings, huh? the, the desires. Huh? Those wise ones with their seeds of becoming destroyed. So we have destroyed the seeds. That doesn't grow anymore. The seeds, right? Uh, go out even as the lamb does. Right? So it is said that uh, when the Buddha was teaching this, then there was a gust of wind. Right? And then the, the lamb that was over there, the lamb just, just got blow off. Right? So it is said that uh, to today, sometimes at the, when the, I think Sri Lankan monks, when they chant the Ratana Sutta, uh, they, they will come to a particular verse, they, uh, so somebody will blow the thing, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Correct, no, it's true, true. Somebody will blow the lights uh, to, to represent this, this verse. Uh, next time you watch, uh, next time you invite Sri Lankan monks uh, to come to your house for blessing, they recite Ratana Sutta, you know, there'll be, there'll be candles, right? You should put candles there, there'll be strings, right? So maybe come and see whether somebody blow the candle. <laughs> if they didn't blow, you remind them about verse for, verse for 14. All right. You remind them verse for verse fourteen. How come B- Buddha's time the lamb go, goes out? You know, nibuti, right? Nibuti. Yeah. <laughs> Election. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very soon it will happen. Yeah. Okay, the last last fifteen, last three verses. Uh, now Saka, now Saka makes the ex- proclamation. We beings that are here assemble, whether terrestrial or celestial. Remember, Saka is the chief of the gods. You know? 
He's supposed to be the leader of the gods of 33. Right? Whether terrestrial or celestial, salute the accomplished Buddha, who is honoured by gods and men. So the Buddha is the teacher of gods and, and, and men. Yeah? That, that is why to the, in, in India, the, the, the Indians, for example, the Hindus, they regard the Buddha as a god, which is actually downgrading him. They regard him as one of their many, many gods. Right? So they said, no harm, one more, so okay. <laughs> they include the Buddha. All right? So he's honoured by gods and men. And then uh, verse 16, we beings that are assembled here salute the Dhamma, enlightening Dhamma. And finally, they salute the Sangha. So this noble Sangha, Arya Sangha, can also include lay people, right? Uh, need not necessarily be only monks and nuns. Because if you are Arya Sangha, then you are en en enlightened. You attain the first stage, second stage, third stage. Right? Then you can be in the Sangha. Okay? supposed to be time for, que for, for questions, but you have already asked questions along the way. <laughs> so, I have to end at 3.30. So, but we still have about 5-10 minutes. And any, any points of clarification? There are 17 verses, right? So, I, I just want to go back to the... structure, you see? So, yeah. So, the first first two are addressed to the devas, that's the beginning, and then the attributes of the sankha, and, in the, and in, inside there, you also find the Buddha explains the characteristics of Nibbana in, in particular, and characteristics of the sankha. Right? I think just now, maybe I did not explain, there's one phrase which says that there will be no eight ex existence. Remember that one? Because it is said that the sotapan, or the first, once you enter, you'll be reborn the most seven times. The most seven times. Yeah. Huh? Ah. Number nine, isn't it? You've been born the most seven times. Actually, uh, this is just a, a little bit more. It says there are three classes of Sotapan. You know. uh, even Sotapana got, 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 got different grades on you know. Oh no, no, no. Chula is slightly different. Uh, ch chula doesn't, doesn't fall into this. Chula, Sotapan is a slightly di di different concept. Here, they, they call it. Uh, one seed sotapan, seed, bg. One seed so, ah, so you got one only one more, well, one more life. One yeah, one seed s e e d, and then you you got the another one the the, the middle the middle range sotapan three to six lives, ah, and then finally you got the sluggish one, very slow one. sluggish you not know, sluggish like snail like that, seven times. So that, that's, the, that's the category. Chula Sotapan uh, is slightly different. It means a lesser Sotapan. It is said that there are, there are, there are a, lot of ex a lot of discussion of who actually qualifies as a Chula Sotapan. They may not necessarily have eradicated the, 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 the tree. So I, I'm not clear about what this Chula Sotapan Correct. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Is before. No, once you are sotapan, you don't regress. Uh, is that? Um, I think once you, you, as long as you are, you reach one of these, the, the sotapan, chula sotapan, yes. Yeah, sotapan, you must have fruition. You know, no fruition, then it's not a sotapan. You must have sotapan. Uh, Maga no pala yet. Yeah, yeah. So you must have fr fruition. That's why it's four pairs, ma. Otherwise, it cannot be the first pair. If you've got fruition, how to turn back? Exactly. So we are talking of fruition. We're talking of fruition. Must have fruition. If you don't have fruition, maga, right, it, it could be a, a, a chula so sotapan. Yeah, yeah. The fruition is the realization. The fruition is a realization. The realization of this non-self, realization of the, the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and the non-attachment, that the rituals, rites, and ceremonies are mere conventions. Entering the, the, the path means you're entering, like for example, practicing the Eightfold Path. So that's called entering the, entering the, the path. Right? Entering the, the stream, so which is the Eightfold Path. Like practicing mindfulness, all this. 
Dharma follow and faith. You mean be becoming Buddhas? As Aryas, yeah. Depends on the speed. Sometimes on the face or on Panya. So these are different. I think a lot of these are commentarial. You know. uh, uh, chula. So wh why I'm saying that sometimes when we read, we've got to be c c careful. Sometimes a lot of these are from the commentaries. Uh, if it's from the text, then, 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 we, then we, we see what. Because even becoming a Buddha, for example, you've got the faith, you've got the, the, the devotions, and then you've got the, 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 the intellect part, so wisdom part, you know. Uh, this is the shortest. Yeah, this is the shortest. Okay, so, so there it is. Okay. Oh, that's, that's, that's uh, the Mahayana Bodhisattva or the Theravada Bodhisattva? <laughs> they, are, they are different. In the Theravada, Bodhisattva is very simple. It's called a Bodhisattva. The word Bodhisattva is Sanskrit, right? So it's a Bodhisattva. It basically refers to someone who make that aspiration to become a Buddha. Like uh, Gautama, our Siddhartha Gautama, I think in his past life, Ipankara, right? As Sumido, isn't it? As, as Sumido, he made that vow. So from that vow, he becomes a Bodhisattva. Then he practices the paramis, perfections after perfections after perfections. But in the Mahayana, it's, it's very different co co concept. Right? So <laughs> we will not go into that. <laughs> because they talk about Bhumis, 10 Bhumis. Ten, ten different stages, the Bodhisattva. In the Mahayana, all of us are Bodhisattvas, you know. Yeah. But we are the unenlightened one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are all we are all, all Bodhisattvas. So we aspire stage by step. You know? Okay? Any any other points? So the technical part we, we believe. I think what is important from, from here is to arouse that faith, that confidence, so that we will we will continue to, to practice the path. You, see? Uh, I, I, you know, the, the, the Buddha as our teacher, right? and then the Dhamma as the teachings. So when we talk about the teachings, so if we are new to Buddhism, let's go, go back to just, for example, the five precepts. Right? Precepts, they are the, the most fundamental and yet so, so important. So we just stick to, to that. Right? So we don't have to worry if we are very new. We don't have to worry whether you want to be the sluggish sotapanna or the one seat sotapanna. Because if we practice, the, 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 if we go in a, in a gradual way, eventually all those things will just flow very naturally. We don't have to worry about it, isn't it? But if we don't even practice the precepts well, but we are too engrossed into, okay, I want to see, I want, don't want to be the sluggish one, I want to be the, 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 the one seat one. Then I think, we, you know, there's a Zen saying, it's like the finger pointing at the moon. But instead of looking at the moon, we get stuck with the finger. And that's a Zen saying, the Chinese uh, Buddhist saying that you know the f you know that the moon. People doesn't know where's the moon. You use a finger to point at the moon. But instead of looking at the moon, we get stuck with a finger that points at the moon. We say, "Oh, your finger should point like that. Your finger should point like this. Why your finger so fat?" You know. <laughs> so we get stuck in the finger. So there's a Zen saying that uh, we should we should not be too preoccupied. All those, because in the first place, all those things we wouldn't know. Right? So what is important is basics, precepts. If we do meditation, you know, we, we just, just watch our rising and falling or watch our breathing in and, and, and breathing out. I think that's, that's, that's re really be helpful. Okay? Enough? <laughs> right. We have a break, is it? Yeah, 3.30. <laughs>